Good morning. <clears throat> good morning. Hey, it's so good to see everybody. You guys can be seated this morning. Um, it is such an honor uh, to be here at the Love is Red conference with it's pretty incredible leaders and pastors. I have so many friends that are part of this uh, conference this year, and so it's a really big deal. Thank you for coming. Uh, my understanding is that most of you are leading uh, in youth ministry in some form or fashion, uh, which is such a passion in my heart. I was a youth pastor for 13 years, uh, full-time, three different churches, uh, starting off in Louisiana, the dirty, dirty south where I hail, uh, southwest Louisiana, and then moving up to Colorado for some years, and then Tucson, Arizona in the desert. And um, it was too hot, so we moved back to Colorado about two years later, um, and there were too many snakes as well. I am not an animal person, just in case anybody was wondering. I was working out yesterday at a local gym, and one of the coaches brought their little dog, and uh, as I was laying on the floor at the end of the workout, I feel something licking my arm, and I about had a heart attack, because I am, I am that guy. Like, roaches, rats, snakes, dogs, cats, they're all the same to me. Uh, so, they all got a good laugh out of that. Uh, it's my first time in the Akron Canton area, and uh, which is really, which is, uh, we ate at one of the best barbecue spots yesterday, I think, in Ohio. But um, I, it's, it's a real honor to be here. I want I wanted to do this. Um, I'm going to introduce my family here in just a few minutes. Um, but because I know what it takes to run a youth conference and oversee conferences, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me just so you know who you're hearing from this morning. Uh, but I do feel like there are some things that I don't want to just talk about um, this morning. I actually, <clears throat> I actually want to impart uh, to your hearts and to your spirits if you are open. And so I want to make good use of our time, but I just want to honor uh, Pastor Josh Pantry. He and I just got connected last year. And so can we just thank God for him and his wife, Jillian? It's always a big deal. It's always a big deal for me because I think people see large events and it's like, I want to do one too. And then you realize what it takes and the faith that it takes and all of those different things. And so it's a real big deal, um, at least to me. So um, I want to introduce my family. I think we have a couple of pictures. Uh, so this is my wife, Octavia. Uh, we've been married for just over 11 years, uh, 11 years married. And then I have two girls. Uh, Ryan is one in the green dress. She's eight. And then there is Miss Nora, who is just fire like she is me. I am her. She gets me. Uh, at 1230 at night, it's me and Nora hanging out. The rest of the family is asleep. And she's like, let's start a movie, Daddy. And I'm like, okay. Um, and so that is Nora Grace. And then finally, we've got my boy. Uh, his name is King, so that everybody will know he's royalty, including him. Uh, his name is King Samuel Randolph, and uh, he is 11 months old, uh, and he has an ear infection right now, and so he's crying a lot. And we took him to my wife took him to the doctor yesterday. Um, and so that is that is my world. We are the Cormiers, uh, and that is pronounced Cormier, C O R. M-I-E-R, uh, hailing from the South, uh, Cajun French. So that is, and then I think we have one more because he's just so cute. Uh, that's King again, and his eyes are just mesmerizing. And we are done in case anybody wants to know. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to make that official in about six weeks, praise God. Um, so, <laughs> which any guys in the room, talk to me after it's because I have so many questions still. For real, for real. I'll let your boy. All right, so, so this morning, uh, this morning, guys, let me tell you a little bit about me, and then, uh, and then we'll jump into what I feel like God's put on my heart uh, for you. So, like I said, I'm from Louisiana, born and raised, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, got an undergrad in business, started uh, youth ministry after a season of um, being with YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Uh, did a DTS in East Texas, spent 30 days in Calcutta, India. While I was there, because a lot of people want to know, how did you start in youth ministry? While I was there, I felt like the Lord just spoke to me uh, in India and was like, I, I want you to move back home and just serve at, at, at your home church, just serve the church that, that impacted you uh, the most. It's a church that I started going to in high school. That I was raised in church my whole life. Uh, 15 years old, I had this uh, dramatic encounter uh, with the Holy Spirit uh, in my kitchen. Um, nobody else was home, watching a televangelist on TV, and got baptized in the Holy Spirit, January 21st, 2000. 
And uh, my whole world changed as a 15-year-old. I was raised in church. My mom's a prayer warrior. My dad's been a deacon, uh, Sunday school teacher in our church my whole life. But January 21st, 2000, 3.42 p.m., as a matter of fact, watching Rod Parsley on TV. It was Breakthrough on TBN. Uh, for those of you who are a little bit old school, uh, I was watching. I just got off the bus, and I had been praying to have this encounter with the Holy Spirit. So nobody else around started speaking in tongues for the first time. And uh, as a freshman in high school, uh, that led to me starting some prayer meetings on my high school campus. Me and about six other people, nothing glamorous or glorious. Uh, we did those prayer meetings really early in the morning, not because we were spiritual, because uh, honestly, I didn't want to be caught dead with these people because they were nerds. And I was <laughs> popular. So, I mean, just these are my confessions. Uh, and so I, we did it really early. It was the dorkiest of groups. Just this one girl had the biggest bracelet you've ever seen in your life. And this other kid had the biggest glasses and... Um, but God met us there those mornings on my high school campus in the math room, the geometry room. And um, I did not know then what I know now because the years have a way of teaching you what the days will never know. And so it, it was much later that I realized that looking back that God was preparing something in me. Um, I want to encourage you, whatever season you are in, please know that if you're ministering to young people, then there comes a point and it is a part of the story of God for your life where you go from talking about things to being able to impart things. This is whenever sometimes whenever Paul was writing in the church and he says, I'm speaking to you by, by impartation. This is how he could tell Timothy what is on the inside of you. I have put on the inside of you with my hands. That wasn't just prayer. That was declarations and that was years of being consistent. Amen. This is why the enemy will always fight you in your consistency because consistency breeds credibility. Come on, somebody. And so, so I didn't realize then what I now know that God was cultivating something on the inside of me because God's ultimate purpose for each of you is that you would carry authority in some aspect of your ministry, your influence, your discipleship, your mentoring, that there would actually be authority on your life because it was the major distinctive between Jesus and every other teacher. Remember what they said whenever he stood up in the temple, who is this? Because he speaks with one who has authority. It wasn't the volume of his voice. It was that whenever he spoke, demons began to move and manifest and life began to be imparted just by him being in the room. And so, so I, I didn't realize it then. So going through high school and, and being faithful in, in the place of prayer, um, prayer is a huge deal. And, and you'll kind of hear some of that in my story and what I'm teaching on this morning. Um, because in those first several years as a 15-year-old, 15 through 18, I was mentored by 60-year-old uh, intercessors. And so I, I was on prayer calls in the morning at 6 a.m. in the morning uh, before I would catch the bus. And we'd just be praying over teenagers and praying for revival and praying for our region. God, pour out your spirit on Louisiana. So going to a state college, Northwestern State University in Natchitoches, Louisiana, that continued. I didn't realize it. I just felt like I kind of stumbled into it. Um, started teaching a prayer meeting every Thursday night for about three years. I'd teach for an hour. And then we would pray for an hour on our campus. And we'd pray over the campus and go on prayer walks and prayer drives and all of those things. Um, I just didn't know it then. And so what I guess I'm saying is pay attention to the rhythms of God and what God is highlighting in this season of your life, because we think so small, don't we? Like we think like neighborhoods, God thinks nations, you know what I'm saying? God, we think minutes, God thinks movements, right? And so I, I want to encourage you, lean into whatever it feels like God is putting grace on in this particular season of your life. That's why the Bible tells us to redeem the time or make the most of your time, right? And so... In college, did my best to, uh, to do that while working on a business administration degree. Um, taught on prayer, was super involved in my, in my campus ministry, uh, which is actually where I met my wife later on, which is a whole nother message about serving together. Come on, somebody. And, uh, and finding your mate. Hallelujah. And so we, uh, so going through that journey, finishing up college, going to YWAM, while I was in YWAM, uh, hearing 
all right, you're supposed to just move back home, serve at your at your church, serve your pastor. So I sent my pastor an email from Calcutta, India, and just said, hey, I'm ready to move back home because I went straight to the mission field after college. College is about two and a half hours away from my home church. And I said, I'm coming back, and lots of different opportunities, lots of things to do. And, uh, and he just said, great, as soon as you, you know, get home, let's talk. And so it got home, uh, talked, and he just said, I want you to just kind of check out what's going on in the youth ministry. And then uh, 13 years later, <laughs> 13 years later, I uh, kept checking out what was going on in youth ministry, but it was about three months in as I would pray for the teenagers that were a part of our, a part of our ministry that God began to kind of bring the story full circle. And uh, that high school campus where I had spent so much time uh, praying ended up substituting there on Fridays, working at the church, you know, Monday through, you know, every day. And uh, but on Fridays during the day would be a high school substitute on my high school campus. And that opened up doors to invite, you know, teenagers to our youth group and all of that. Um, And then it was some years later that we moved up to Colorado Springs to be a part of a massive youth movement called Desperation um, at New Life Church. And for five years had the honor and the privilege of overseeing a large youth conference five six thousand students would come from across the from across the nation and um we would get the opportunity to mobilize them primarily in the place of prayer and living in desperate pursuit of God. And so doing that five years, moving to Tucson, Arizona, and then going back, taking the major step of faith, just going into full-time travel ministry. And then about six months into that journey, after moving back to Colorado Springs, the Lord saying, uh, the real reason why I brought you and Octavia and your family back is to start a presence-driven, a spirit-filled, multi-ethnic, multicultural life-giving church in Colorado Springs. It's full of the presence of God, full of the power of God, um, but just life-giving and diverse. And so we said yes uh, in 2019. Uh, We announced that in January of 2020, the year of which we don't speak, uh, 2020, and and we had our first interest party uh, the first week of March. Uh, We were planning on having our second one the third week of March. And then, uh, you know, the world World shut down. And so we thought, like many of us, well, we'll just kind of postpone and, you know, we'll do it again, you know, once all this hoopla is over. And uh, and it never ended, right? Like all of 2020. But um, we just had this conviction on the inside of us that God was calling us to plant this church. We planted through the amazing church planting organization that is our family, ARC, the Association of Related Churches. And um, There were many moments along the way of like, God, are you really sure? There's a book that changed my world years and years ago. It actually led to me going to YWAM. It was written by the founder of YWAM, Youth with a Mission, the largest interdenominational short-term missions movement in the whole world, Youth with a Mission. It was written by Lauren Cunningham, who founded YWAM. It's called, Is That Really You, God? That's just the story of him hearing God to start this missions organization. And that was the prevailing question in that season. God, is this really you? I mean, Lord, did you know that there would be a global pandemic? Who does, you know what I'm saying? And, and, um, overwhelmingly the Lord was like, I, this didn't surprise me. Here's the thing about God that I've learned. He'll get you to say yes before he gives you all the relevant details because we're on a need to know basis, right? (laughs) And I didn't need to know that, uh, you know, in January. And had I known that, I'm not sure I would have had the faith to continue saying yes, but my wife and I were very determined. And so we had a few more smaller interest parties in our basement and a couple online. And um, on September the 13th, 2020, uh, Zeal Church launched uh, with over 800 and something people who showed up at a high school uh, in the middle of a global pandemic wearing their little mask. All of my anti-maskers showed up with masks. And uh, it was a move of God because we had to wear masks because we were in a local high school and there was no other way to beat. And so uh, I had uh, 784 for people who stayed and attended, and um, there was only space to do two services inside of the building. And so we spontaneously did services outside during the inside services. So I literally ran, they were like, there's hundreds of people outside. So I stood on a chair and preached 
uh, in the grass in front of the high school uh, twice. And so the worship team came out. They sang a cappella because we had no preparation for this. Went inside and preached live stream and then did it all over again for the second service of so four services. Did that for about four weeks and people continued to come and um, and get saved and people of different races. And if you, unless you live under a rock, you could know the racial division of 2020, uh, really being pushed forward with the murder of George Floyd and all the things that happened in the election and all of that. And God's been very, very faithful to breathe his life on Zill Church. And so hundreds of people are getting saved. We just broke a thousand people just a couple of months ago and uh, 10 and a half months in. I tell you all those stories so that you know who you're kind of hearing from a little bit because um, we do everything as my dear friend and brother last night reminded us, Jabin Chavez, we do everything by faith. We receive everything by faith. We preach to young people by faith. We frame our futures by faith. We give them examples, and we hope that we're making some type of difference and impact in their lives by faith. We have godly marriages, and we live in holiness, and we pursue purity, all of those things by faith. Here's the thing that by faith... I want you to receive this morning, and here's what I want you to take away. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Traveling with me today is uh, incredible, just son in the Lord. His name is Nathan Schaffner. Y'all give it up for Nathan Schaffner. He's traveling with me. He and his wife are so dear to my wife and I, and uh, he recently, he's our newest staff member at Zill Church as a Connections pastor. He was intern in Colorado for some years and then a youth pastor, and so they just moved from Arizona uh, to Colorado Springs to serve on our staff, which I'm so excited about. Um, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, it says this, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Do you believe that the Spirit of the Lord is not only in you, but upon you. He comes in you to satisfy you, to complete you, to empower you, but he comes upon you so that you may work the works of God and you may do so through his power and through his inspiration, but having his backing. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is, of course, Jesus talking because if there's anyone who is the most secure person who ever walked the face of the planet, it is Jesus. So he could confidently say because of all the time that he has spent with his father, both as the pre-existent Christ, right, before he came through the virgin Mary, because of all that time that he spent together with the father from the beginning of time, but also because of all the time that he spent with his heavenly father, right? As a child, I must be about my father's business. He can make this statement with full confidence and full clarity. And I believe that this was the seed bed. This was the bedrock of why Jesus did everything that Jesus could do was because at his core, he knew that the spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed. Everybody say anointed. We have a lot of animated youth pastors and youth preachers and youth leaders, but my concern is that we settle for animation as opposed to anointing. And we see the result of it because we add to people by what we say, but we multiply in young people by who we really are. What's in you gets multiplied in them. What comes out of you gets added to them. We all know the difference between addition and multiplication. We're into addition, God's into multiplication. Read the book of Acts, right? So because he anointed me, and here's what Jesus said, he has anointed me to do, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Verse 20 says this, and he closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? 
my first experience really that I can remember of significance with the anointing, I was a teenager. I was at a worship night. Uh, there was a group of young people from our city who were singing at this, at this special event. And I've grown up singing my whole life in church. And, um, but, but, but what they had was different. Whenever they sang, it's like heaven filled the room. That was the only way I could describe it. From that moment forward, I began to pray, Lord, I want the anointing of your Holy Spirit on my life and on whatever future you have for me. I don't want to do it without your anointing, without your power, without your presence. And my friends, I don't care if you're in full-time vocational ministry or you don't have a title at all um, because titles only really just kind of validate wh who you already are, what you're already doing. So whether you're in full-time vocational, bivocational, a volunteer, drive a bus, whatever it is, here's what I need you to know. You need to do whatever it is that God's calling you to do to impact young people, empowered by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I know we all know that mentally, but there has to be something on the inside of you that says, Lord, if our budget goes or if the lights go out or whatever it is, God, it's your anointing that I know that's what makes the difference. That's what's going to impact young people. That's what's going to put something on the inside of them that years from now, that'll be a thing that transformed their lives. Amen. And so I started reading everything I could find on the anointing of the Holy Spirit as a teenager. So I read everything from Smith Wigglesworth to Oral Roberts to Catherine Coleman to Benny Hinn and other legendary people um, in church history. And, and here's what I found. Here's what I found. I know it was before Benny Hinn, whatever. And so it was, here's what I, here's, here's what I found. Um, there was this common theme in all of their lives, significant men and women of God who really shook nations. Two things that I found, number one was sacrifice, and number two was a protection. Sacrifice and protection were necessary. I think I found that to be true in my life as well. So, so here's what we need to know. There's a few points. Even Jesus needed the anointing. Even Jesus needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit to fulfill what God had asked him to do, what God had called him to do. So there was a clearly marked difference and shift that took place in the life of Jesus once he was anointed because we are anointed for service. So after Jesus' public declaration of his ministry, he's immediately attacked. The anointing will attract necessary opposition in your life. I'll say it again for the people in the back. The anointing will attract necessary opposition in your life. If you can remember that the enemy is opposing you because of the anointing you carry, and I wish I could tell the 24-year-old version of myself this. If you can remember that the enemy is opposing you because of the anointing you'll carry, you carry, you'll learn not to take things so personally. And I think if we're honest, can't we take things super personally? They're against me. My pastor hates me. That parent wants to kill me. That student thinks I suck. Life is awful. God's upset with me. I'm sick. My marriage. You fill in the blank. Whatever your context is, right? You'll take things a whole lot less personally if you'll realize Oh, this is about what I carry. This is about what God has entrusted and released on my life. The oil that is on my life. Your greatest battle will be for the oil that God has, is wanting to and has purposed you to carry in your life. If there was ever a generation of youth leaders, small group leaders, youth pastors, youth ministers, whatever your title is. If there was ever a moment in church history where we needed more influencers of youth and young adults who valued the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is now. It's now because our teenagers are consuming things that don't satisfy and they're consuming ways to get results that aren't rooted and lodged in the word of God. So if I just have a bunch of followers on social media, that somehow makes me an influencer. And surely I have the character to sustain this. And what they quickly and what we quickly find out is, no, you don't. 
It's called artificial maturity. Just because you know it doesn't make you mature because maturity is a result of actually knowing something and practicing something over the long haul that gives you a rooted confidence, not a cockiness. And there is a difference. Amen? Okay, perfect. So, so, so the anointing will attract necessary opposition in, in your life. Um, goodness, it, it, had I known this, the... Uh, the level of offense would have gone down. Come on, anybody ever been offended before? Come on, just raise your hand. The rest of you are lying. Repent. Um, the I would say the I would say the the potency of the offense and its effect or impact on me would have been dramatically reduced had I just understood. And I think if you understand whatever season you're in, oh, this isn't necessarily about me. See, the enemy's choice weapon when attacking the anointing on your life is people. <laughs> Remember that. Your fight is not with man. Your fight is never with man. Your fight is not with a certain leader. Your fight is not with your pastor. Your fight is not with a parent. Your fight is not with, your fight is not with man. Because of the anointing on Jesus' life, they literally tried to kill Jesus. At one point, almost pushing him off a cliff. But, but here's the deal. The anointing is the precursor to authority that God wants you to walk in. Authority is not connected to your age. I've seen actually some 20-year-olds who carry more spiritual authority than some 40-year-olds in my life. So it's not an age thing, right? So the anointing is the precursor to authority. Luke 4.32, I want to point out to you one more time. What was it about Jesus? What was the distinctive that they all concluded individually, but everybody in the room was thinking it? He speaks as one with authority. And then they go on to think, and not like the rest of the scribes. Lots of preachers, lots of youth communicators, lots of youth influencers, all of those things. But what I'm seeing as I travel the country and even internationally and interacting in youth and young adult circles is, gosh, we need more who value the anointing and the presence of God on our ministries more than anything else, you guys. Everything else is great, but it's kind of like the principle that Jesus gave us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those other things will be, will be added to you. The anointing that God has on your life is for a people and a purpose. The anointing that God has on your life is for a people and for a purpose. So the journey of stewarding your anointing, which has to do with our spiritual disciplines this morning, the journey of stewarding your anointing well begins with discovering who exactly God has called you to, not who God has called you to be, who God has called you to. And the anointing on your life is personal and it's purposeful. In the launch of our church, even whenever we're in youth ministry, um, there are things that you will learn about you. Because here, here, is why, here is why opposition is necessary. Opposition doesn't, it can change you, but, but the purpose of opposition in your life, those opposition comes to only reintroduce you to you. It reveals to you who you really are, where you're lacking, what you've got, where you've got grace at, where you've got strength, all of those things. And so, so ultimately, God is trying to get you to understand there is a group, there is a demographic, there is a age, that whatever it is, whatever, however unique it is on your life, this is who I've called you to reach. And God will begin breaking your heart for that particular, for some of you, it's maybe young women. For some of you, it's broken guys. For some of you, it's fatherlessness. I, I don't know what those things are, but it's the reoccurring thing that, that breaks your heart. Um, the anointing God has on your life is for a people and for a, for a purpose. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses 21 through 22 says this. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. For 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. 
So let's talk about the anointing just for a couple minutes. The anointing uh, in the Old Testament, uh, it's the Hebrew word mishak or mishak. It literally means to smear. And though inanimate objects were anointed in the Old Testament, they were prim- there were primarily three roles in which people served that were anointed, right? There was prophets, it was priests, and it was kings. So each of these were designed to be major roles of service to God's people. Here's what I need you to know, because maybe you came in unaware or maybe somewhere along the journey of serving young people. Perhaps you forgot this truth. And I am just part of my assignment this morning is to call your spirit to attention and to awaken once again to this reality that your life is to be smeared with the presence of God. Again, the image here is the crushing of the olive and then the, uh, the, uh, how the oil was taken, sometimes poured, but oftentimes it was smeared, like pushed on so that everybody knew, everybody recognized who was anointed in the Old Testament physically. Well, can I tell you, everybody can recognize the anointing that you carry spiritually nowadays or the anointing that we lack if we don't have the faith to receive that and we don't sacrificially live in such a way that we guard the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Over the last decade or so, there have been so many conversations and even in full-time youth ministry and raising up interns and raising up young people that are all over the country now serving. Um, there's this thing about just having a personal, uh, just personal convictions, you guys. And I know this isn't like super sexy and all those things, but but just having like some kind of like, like, like being men and women of like like conviction, like there's just personal sense. Like nobody has to tell me like, oh, you can't do this, 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 and this. But I want to encourage every single one of you to live in light. Here's the deal. You can tell how aware someone is of the anointing that they carry as ministry leaders by the way that we live our lives. And whenever we are aware of the high value of God's presence, which we carry, we just live differently. So nobody has to tell us, well, don't do this and don't watch that and don't go here and don't drink that and don't be a... That's what we follow. But whenever you have a greater revelation that what I do and, and how I carry myself and how I... All of those things is somehow connected to, to, to the anointing that I carry then it becomes so easy. I can't tell you the sacrificial decisions that I made in my teenage years as a single man, and then even now into marriage that nobody has to tell me what those things are. It's, no, there's an anointing, and I want to be faithful to steward what God has released on my life. So I guess the thought-provoking question is, how well are you stewarding the anointing that God has placed on your life, at least in this season, to impact young people? Are you stewarding that well? I don't know. Only you can answer that. You and the Holy Spirit, right? Um, So so, uh, protecting the anointing on your life. Remember I said, I I studied and just kind of looked at all these people that carried heavy anointings and just, you know, walked in the supernatural and impacted people, all of those things. And and again, there was this common theme of, man, I've, I've, Anything that's valuable to you, you, you protect, right? Like we lock our houses at night. We lock our cars, hopefully, whenever you have something of value inside. You lock your hotel room, all of those things. Because what's valuable to you, you'll protect it at all costs. All costs. So anointing and personal holiness, as opposed to positional holiness, are inextricably linked. Okay, I'll say it again. Anointing and personal holiness as opposed to positional holiness. Whenever God calls us, whenever he saves us, the Bible says he sanctifies us, he sets us apart, he, all those things, that's positional holiness. We are holy before the Lord. But then there's this other expression of holiness, which is behavioral holiness. And that's what we are growing in or what we are called to grow in through the years. The goal is hopefully we're living at a higher degree of holiness after years of walking with Jesus than whenever we first met him. That's the goal. 
Now, unfortunately, that's not true. <laughs> for, for, some, for, for some people, their, their, their highest expression of holiness was in their first couple of years, their first months of knowing Jesus. And then, you know, culture and all sorts of things kind of, well, I'm not sure. I mean, does that really matter? And they kind of live in, in, this, in this life of compromise and they don't realize how it weakens the anointing that God has called them to live out, to operate in, in their lives. Does this make sense, everyone? I know it's not super exciting, but I promise you we're going somewhere. Um, because God's intention this morning in this very session is to increase his oil and increase his power in you guys' youth ministries. That's where we're going. That's the goal, right? I got to lay a foundation for you. So anointing and personal as opposed to positional holiness are inextricably linked. So you can have lots of talent, you can have lots of volume, you can have lots of charisma, and I love all those things. I value all of those things. But at the end of the day, if there's nothing to destroy yokes of bondage and depression and heaviness off of the lives of young people, then what are we actually doing? So I guess the next question is, do you see yourself as a yoke breaker? Do you see yourself, do you carry enough anointing to whenever you pray over that young person that the back of depression is actually broken off of their lives? Or that thing of insecurity that they've carried for years and years because of the price that you are paying secretly in the secret place and warring for them and the decisions that you're making in personal. Well, I guess what I'm trying to get you to understand is that sin may be private, but it's never personal. It has ripple effects. And in the same way, your decision to say yes to what you're called to say yes to and no to what you're called to say no to somehow has the ability to impact a generation because of the ripple effect. Because if you can impact one young person, you have the potential to touch an entire household or an entire school. I need you to understand and believe at that level because what you are doing matters. It matters that you're here at the Love is Red Conference. It matters that you took several days out of whatever it is that your normal schedule or pattern, all of those things because we actually believe that in these contexts, young people's lives, they can be marked forever. But all of this is connected to your personal decisions of conviction and holiness and purity and righteousness, no matter what anybody else is doing in the culture, even in the church world, because God help us. There's a, don't look there for your standard, because whoo, all right. And so, 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 whatever that is, the Holy Spirit reveals it. So, holiness and sacrificial obedience produce more of God's anointing on your lives. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Is there anything that Jesus has been inviting you into doing or inviting you to let go of or inviting you to change? Any of those things that you've kind of been slow moving to like, all right, Lord, I'm I just what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that that hinders the anointing and the impact and the influence that God has called you to have. Does that make sense? So obedience is better than sacrifice. We know that the scriptures tell us sacrificial obedience is even better. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Sacrificial obedience is the goal. Remember Jesus came and he said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And it's so interesting to me because the idea of grace in the New Testament is not that we sort of do less. It's actually that we're empowered to do more. Has anybody read the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> And so it's, it, Jesus elevated everything, everything, everything. You say, don't, don't like murder someone. I say, if you even look on one lustfully, you've, uh, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you hate your brother, you murder. Everything was elevated. But whenever we live lives of compromise and no personal conviction, what happens is we weaken the potency, the quality, the authenticity of the anointing 
on our lives. And so then we have youth ministries that are maybe even big or have lots of activity and have lots of, but, but there's no prayer that's taking place. There's no, there's, there's no like depth in terms of discipleship. So like 10 years from now, I remember in the early years of youth ministry and people were like, man, you're such a good youth pastor. I'm like, we really won't know that until about 10 years from now. <laughs> really? See, we're never as bad as people think or say we are, and we're never as good as they say we are, too. <laughs> so just, just balance it, right? You're never as bad as what your critics tell you are. Never. But you're never as great as people tell you are. You're somewhere in the middle, right? Believe that. We're to see God earnestly and fervently for his anointing on our lives first and then on our ministries secondly. So, so here's the practical part. How do you guard the anointing? Brandon, like, what do you, what, what do you mean, like, about protecting all those things? Here's, here's some practical things. Number one, you guard the anointing. So we live sacrificially, but then, so sacrifice and protection. Remember, those are the two kind of, the two kind of points upon which the anointing is increased and stewarded well in your life, all that. So sacrificial, but then secondly, we protect it. So number one, we guard the anointing best by number one, prayer. Everybody say prayer. And prayer is one of those things that, you know, we all, it, it, it's, it's like, yeah, I pray. It, wonderful. Um, I think it's one of those things that as we lean into it more, God begins to grow your heart in the place of prayer. Um, every season's different. But, but here's the conviction that I had, and I think this is, I, I shared with you guys some of those statistics and what God's doing in our church now and all those different things. We're just 10 and a half months old. God's breathing on it, all those things. But what you have to realize is that um, everything is to be birthed in the place of prayer. And I know everybody's like, yeah, 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 yeah I get it. No, no, no. No, everything. Everything of significance, everything of value that God has actually entrusted to us must be birthed and bathed in prayer. So whatever your new discipleship initiative, birth it and bathe it in prayer. Whatever you're like, man, we're going to have hours. Awesome. Make sure it's birthed in and bathed in prayer and teach those, your leadership teams, your young people, if you will teach them the value of prayer by actually modeling. How do you do that? Well, number one, it's having a private prayer life, but then it's also praying in front of them, praying with them. You're, there's nothing more frustrating than, than, than whenever it's like, all right, let's pray. And everybody's like, and you're like, what, what does that mean? How are we Go into all the world and disciple nations is what Jesus says, and teaching them to observe all things. There has to be some level of observation. Like if the students that are following you never hear you pray, I just, I'm like, what? I got questions. You see what I'm saying? And it's not that you have to pray a certain way. It's not that you have to do, but how will they know? From whom will they learn? The quickest and the most potent way of strengthening someone's prayer life is to put them around people who pray. Ask me how I know. Because for me, it was on the phone with men and women in their 60s, mostly 60-year-old white women who I was on the phone with who went to the Assembly of God church down the street. And they're like, Brandon, you're going to be a prayer warrior. You're going to be an intercessor. I couldn't even spell the word intercession in high school, okay? I didn't even know what it meant. And then I would listen to them pray. And I would go to prayer meetings. I'm just saying in the context of your youth ministry, your small group, whatever it is, however you just can we be a little bit more intentional about creating some environments where students hear you as the leader and or people who are serving under you where they actually hear you pray. It has more of an impact, you guys. I think we tend to complicate this and it's like, mm, it's not that hard. How did the disciples learn to pray? How practical was it? Well, it's the only corporate question that we see and one of the most significant that they asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Are we living lives in such a way that your young people are asking you, hey, will you, will you teach me how to pray? Is there evidence enough of your prayer life as a worship leader, as a small group leader, that they're even remotely interested 
in your prayer life. Isn't that so good? I hope you're encouraged to not, don't feel shamed. Don't feel uh, prayer shamed. Okay. It's just that, but, but if I'm being honest, as I look back and having a little bit of a modicum of success in youth ministry and impact and influence, oftentimes people want the pragmatic steps. And I'm telling you, at least for us, both in the planting of our church and in building a pretty good amount of disciples through the years, it had more to do with prayer than probably anything else. And that's not unique to me. I think as we look at Jesus, his model, he was always off praying, sometimes by himself, oftentimes with a group, Peter, James, and John, or the other 12, because I think it was important for them to hear how he spoke to his father. And then we get glimpses of it in the gospels, right? Both in the synoptics and then in John's. It's like, oh, and, th and that's how he talked to his father. Because prayer reveals, I believe more than anything else, what we really think about ourselves in light of who God is. Prayer reveals our theology. We can say that we believe God to move mountains and do miracles and way maker and all those things. But what comes out of us in the place of prayer is the real litmus as to whether or not those things are true. And so in the lives of young people, as it comes to spiritual disciplines and influencing them, they need to hear you pray bold and ferocious prayers that are full of faith. God, we're going to reach our city for you. God, we, you may not even know how, how to do it does not matter, but the more bold and lofty prayers you pray, what you do is you raise, in, uh, uh, like even just unconsciously, what you're doing is that you're raising the water level of expectation on the inside. Because if, if you believe that, if you believe God can do that, then I can believe that God can transform this heart of mine. God can touch my friends who don't know you. God, you see what I'm saying? So number one prayer, number two, how do you, how do you guard the anointing? Uh, another, a second way is just by pursuit, your own pursuit of the Lord, your consistency and time with Jesus, your, how you come after him. Number three is perseverance, how well you stand up under pressure, how much stick-to-itiveness you have, how much grit you have on the inside of you whenever everything's going wrong, whenever it looks like it's all about to fall apart, that there's a word on the inside of you that says, I know that God's going to come through. I know that God's going to heal. I know that God is faithful to deliver whatever those things are. So prayer, pursuit, perseverance, and then lastly, we guard the anointing best by proper boundaries. Proper boundaries. And that can be a whole session in and of itself. There's a couple things what I mean by that. Just proper boundaries. That's personal convictions. Once again, there are just certain things. I just decided a long time ago. I was with, so blessed to be a mentor about one of the greatest uh, influencers and really authorities in youth ministry for years and years now, upwards of five decades, Jeannie Mayo, and just a, a personal mentor and, and all of that some years ago. And I made a decision, this is who I'm going to be and this is who I'm not going to be. This is what I'm willing to fail at and this is what I'm not willing to fail at. This was years ago before I was even married. And I encourage you, if you haven't done that in light of the ministry call that's on your life, you need to do that. Almost just making a list. Here's what I'm, because you got to be willing to fail at something. I know that's not very, what, but you, listen, you're not, again, you're not that amazing. Okay. So there's, there, there's going to be some things where, and no matter how talented you are, I get it, but just making a decision, like I'm willing to fail at this, but, but I'm not willing to fail at, at, at that. So like, I'm, I, I may be not the greatest communicator or whatever, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to fail at living a consecrated lifestyle. See what I'm saying? I think whenever we don't define those things, it's kind of like, oh, it all just kind of blends together. And if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Um, proper boundaries. Here's the conviction level. No matter how big I get, no matter how influential I get, these are the things that help to ground us in the place of reality. And if there's ever a time where we needed more people who are grounded in a place of reality and identity in Christ, it's now. Amen. I want to close with this, this, this poem that was shared with me by a mentor over a decade ago. It just says this, if, um, if God has called you to be really like Christ in all, your, in all your heart and all your spirit, he will 
draw you into a life of humility and, and, and put on you such demands of obedience that he'll not allow you to follow sometimes other great Christians. And in many ways, he will seem to let other people do things that he won't let you do. Others can brag on themselves and their work and their success on their writings, but the Holy Spirit will not allow you to do any such thing. The Lord will let others be honored and put forward and keep you hidden away in obscurity because he wants to produce some choice, fragrant fruit for his glory, which can be produced only in the shade. God will let others be great, but he may keep you small. He He'll let others do a great work for him and get credit for it, but sometimes he'll make you work and toil on without knowing how much you're doing. And then to make your work still more precious, he'll let others get the credit sometimes for the work that you've done. And this will make your reward 10 times greater when he comes. The Holy Spirit will put strict watch over you with a jealous love, and he'll rebuke you for little words and feelings or for wasting your time which other Christians Christians never seem to get distressed over. So make up your mind that God is an infinite sovereign and has a right to do what he pleases with his own. And he'll not explain to you a thousand things which may puzzle your reason in his dealing with you. He'll wrap you up in a jealous love and let other people say and do many things that you cannot do or say. Settle it forever that you're to deal directly with the Holy Spirit and that he is to have the privilege of tying your tongue or chaining your hand or closing your eyes in ways that others are not dealt with. Now, when you are so possessed with the living God that you are in your secret heart, pleased and delighted over these particular, personal, private, jealous guardianship and management of the Holy Spirit over your life, you will have found the vestibule of heaven. My friends, what I'm telling you is, at the end of the day, you add to people by what you say, but you multiply in young people who you are. And I can tell you after 17 years or so of really walking with Jesus, I'm more in love with Jesus now at 37. Oh, crap, I'm going to be 38 this year. The... I can't believe it. Um, 37 going on 38 at the end of the year. Um, Then that passionate, uh, fiery 16, 15, 16 year old. And that comes from a place of not doing everything perfect by any means. I have had my share of mistakes. But it's living with a personal conviction that the presence of God will take priority over everything and everyone else. And that road has been paved with decisions that even when given opportunity to bash people, to do whatever, to dishonor people, we all have temptation to walk in offense and ah, or God, why did you let them get away with that and not me? Or why is, why is the grass is always greener, right? On the other side of the fence, the water bill's higher, right? And, and so Whenever you kind of settle it in your heart, Lord, my aim and my goal is to please you in all that I do. And my aim and my goal, love God, but then loving people. And I love them by protecting and stewarding and sacrificially living in such a way that the oil that is on my life, the anointing, has increased over time and being just fine with that. And knowing that as you serve young people in this context of impacting young people, that every decision that you make is tied to how well you impact them, how much authority you have. And so really it's just an invitation to walk in greater authority. We bow your heads with me real quick. So I want to pray. And I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to do a few things before we, before we dismiss our time here together. And as you think about this, I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking and just revealing some areas in our lives. I had a mentor once say, don't ever become better at giving altar calls than you are at responding to altar calls. We're great at giving altar calls as youth leaders and youth pastors. But my prayer over the last 13 years has been, don't ever let me be better at inviting than actually responding whenever you're speaking 
So Holy Spirit, I invite you into this space and in this moment. I say let the presence of God fill this room, fill every heart right now, Lord. And I pray Psalm 139, 24, and 25 in the heart of every leader. These amazing sons and daughters who are sacrificially imparting and giving and teaching and loving this next generation. Such a pivotal generation that we are called to influence. What an honor. What a privilege. But Lord, our confession is this. We cannot do it without you. We don't want to do it without your presence. Holy Spirit, I pray that you just begin to whisper now. What are the areas of sacrifice that you are calling us to lay down as leaders, knowing that we can never with integrity invite young people to do something that we're not willing to do ourselves. I pray in the name of Jesus that as you make this clear to your sons and daughters, I ask that you to increase the oil on their personal lives and on their ministry. And now I pray for those who have been under an attack and they've been taking it personally. Where Lord, the smile has had to mask the inward attacks, whether it's on relationship or families or in their, in their own minds. God, I pray that you would fill them with your presence right now and that you give to them, even as Paul prayed, give to them a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of Christ, how deeply they're loved. I want to give you an opportunity if you say, gosh, there's been some attacks that I've been walking through and I, the Holy Spirit is convicting me right now. It's, I've been taking that a little bit too personally <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. I want you to lift up both your hands to the Lord because I feel like he's going to respond, as you respond, he's going to respond to you. Yeah, so that moment, that word is for you this morning. Father, I pray that where we have taken it personally, as I have done a thousand times, God, I ask you in the name of Jesus for fresh clarity. Your word says where there is no prophetic vision, we cast off restraint. I declare and I speak such an element of self-control and groundedness. As a matter of fact, Lord, I see where so many, where it's been just like this assault in their minds and in their thought lives of struggling with these thoughts. Lord, I pray right now, I see you just piercing through the clouded thoughts with a clarity and that that clarity is coming from a greater revelation of how deeply loved they are. And so, Lord, I pray for a prophetic elevation of vision, Lord. Give them heaven's perspective of what you're doing in their lives and what you have placed on their lives. God, I pray where there has been discouragement and shame, I break it off of your sons and your daughters right now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that as a result, the oil is increasing, Lord. I thank you for discipleship like never before. I thank you for a wisdom in mentoring and leading and praying. God, I pray for a fresh anointing on their prayer lives even now in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Spirit, come and breathe afresh on them. For we realize this, your word is called this to be being filled with the Spirit. So I ask right now, if you all just be so kind, everyone just lift up your hands right now. Lord, I pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh infusion of your presence. God, fresh vision. Lord, fresh grace on their hands as you steady their hands. I say to them, like Paul said to Timothy, be strong in the grace of God that has been released over your life. And where there's been discouragement and even seeds of bitterness where the enemy has tried to come in and sow bitterness and sow contempt. God, I thank you that it's being uprooted right now. And that clarity is coming and replacing every lie with truth. Holy Spirit of the living God, give them grace to live out of everything that you've invited them to walk in so that they may have a greater impact on the young people that they're serving. I bless every ministry. I bless every marriage. And I bless every family that's represented in this room this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, guys.